I don't see any more folks in the waiting room, so I guess we can get started. So welcome everyone tonight. Our program is a wonderful collection of different gardening tips and practices. And we are thrilled to be hosted by the Napa County Library. And so I want to introduce Stefna Pramick, who's our host tonight for the Napa County Library. Go ahead, Stefna. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, the Napa County Library, we're delighted to work in partnership with the UC Master Gardeners of Napa County, who bring these wonderful monthly programs to you. Now, over the past months, we've had the opportunities to learn about making good plant selections for our yard space. And tonight, the UC Master Gardeners, they're going to provide good practical tips regarding good practices in the garden. And don't forget to visit our library. We have a home and garden section where you will find books on the topic. So I hope to see you at the library. Enjoy tonight's program. Thank you, Stefna. And I am now gonna turn it over to our speaker tonight. That's Olga. And she's gonna provide the rest of the program for you. So welcome everyone and listen up. Go ahead, Hi. Olga. <laughs> Hi, I'm Olga. Welcome to tonight's presentation. A potpourri of gardening tips and best practices. I am a master gardener of the Napa County. We are a volunteer organization. We're trained through the University of California Extension Program. And our purpose, our mission, is to provide science-based information, gardening information, to our community. Tonight's program is going to be a little unconventional. Instead of being focused on one specific topic, I'm going to cover a variety of short, short subjects. What's wrong with my plant? Where do I find good answers? Taking care of your gardening tools, managing those pesky yellow jackets, and maybe debunking some um, popular wives tales. You know, there's a lot of information on the internet and a lot of it is vague or contradictory. Which source should we trust? Is the author using proven science-based data? Does the author even live in the same part of the world that we do and experience the same climate and seasons that we do here in the Napa Valley? I'm going to use my poor bougainvillea plant as an example of where to find good solid information. My poor bougainvillea, I've had it for a few years. It's surviving, but it sure doesn't look like it's thriving, sure doesn't look like those beauties that are sold at the nurseries. So I'm trying everything. I'm fertilizing it, I'm giving it more water. What am I doing wrong? Well, a good place to start is right here on our Napa County Master Gardener website. And I think most of you have been on our website. It's probably where you have registered for tonight's library talk. So using this search box up at the top, all I'm going to do is type in my subject, bougainvillea, and the search results are going to return um, articles written by our very own master gardeners here in Napa County. So I got lucky and the first search found an article all about bougainvillea. It happened to be about how to um, espalier your bougainvillea, but it gave me all the answers that I was looking for. And here's what I learned. The bougainvillea needs at least five hours of direct sunlight. Check, got that right. It also needs excellent drainage. Yep, it's in a planter with good drainage. It says here that it does not does not like temperatures below 60 degrees. Well, no wonder these plants just flourish in Southern California. It does get below 60 here in Napa, but I've planted mine 
right next to the house for extra warmth and it gets lots of good morning sunshine. So I'm gonna keep working at it and try to make it a success. This article also tells me that once it's established, the plant is drought tolerant and does not like wet feet. I should only be watering it when the plant leaves start to wilt. I should be watering it deeply and avoid light frequent frequent waterings. Uh-oh. I've had this plant for quite a few years, so it's definitely established. I'm going to need to take it off the drip system because it's being watered too often. The article also tells me that the plants do better, they do well with constrained and crowded roots. So don't hurry to repot. Check, not going to repot it anytime soon. I also learned that the bougainvillea blossoms only on new growth. So pruning and pinching are important techniques to promote abundant growth and flowering. Well, this is something that I need to change. I have not been pruning because I want it to grow all the way up the trellis. And also, this plant has very long, sharp thorns. So the important lesson is here that I need to understand the plant's needs more thoroughly before I start attempting to treat the perceived problem. So let's consider if I had not found the answers that I was looking for on this first attempt. Here's where I would look next. It's the home page on our website. <clears throat> and there's a section called gardening questions. Let's select this. We arrive at this page where we have several options. One option is to reach out to our help desk. You can phone our number, which is 253-4143 and leave a telephone message. Or you can fill out this online diagnostic form and email it to us. And one of our master gardeners will get back to you within 48 hours. Or if you prefer to do your own research, there is a section down at the bottom. It's called Garden Books and Resources. And if we select that, we come to a page that has a wealth of great information. Up here, you can see there are all sorts of garden tips. There are videos from the University of California there are blogs by master gardeners. And down here, oops, I'm sorry, a little pop-up screen came up. <laughs> uh, down at the bottom, there is a section called Garden Pests and Diseases of California. So if we choose that, we're going to come to a page where it's going to give us very specific problems. So say I had a problem where I noticed that something was eating the leaves of my bougainvillea. A good place to be, a good place to look at is this garden pests and diseases. Remember, it's important to first identify the plant and the real problem before you begin any kind of treatment. So still using my bougainvillea example, I would select trees and shrubs because the bougainvillea is a shrub with vine-like <coughs> um, tentacles. From here, I would select um, the shrub called the bougainvillea. And when I do that, I arrive at a page that's dedicated to the bougainvillea. 
you can see in the middle section, there's a plant description and a brief description what the optimum conditions for its growth are. And on the right hand side, there are two columns and they list the most common um, pests and uh, diseases for the bougainvillea. And I noticed there's something called the bougainvillea looper that's highlighted in green. So let's see what that is all about. If we select the bougainvillea looper, <clears throat> we come to a page that shows pictures of the actual caterpillar and the type of damage that it does to our leaf. So, you know, back in the bougainvillea page, you can check out all the other common pests and problems to see, to find, you know, your problem and what the possible solution would be. I want to show you one last place on our website for answers. Back on the gardening resources page, there's a box called UC IPM's plant diagnostic tool. UC, of course, stands for the University of California and IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. And this is a strategy for solving pest problems while minimizing risks to people and the environment. In short, that means only resorting to pesticides, the use of pesticides as an absolute last resort. <clears throat> so using this um, diagnostic tool is pretty similar to the examples that we used before. However, the IPM tool can be much more focused. When we come to this page, you select the plant, just like we did before, but you can also select the plant part that you are noticing a problem on. For example, you can select the leaves or you can select the stem, or if you are noticing some peculiar things going on with the flower, you can select that part of the plant. And then also you can zero right in on the kind of damage. So here, as you can see, I've selected the bougainvillea and the plant part that I'm having problems with are the leaves. So this page, you're really getting down to the nitty gritty. <clears throat> it shows, demonstrates and um, briefly describes the kind of problems that you might see on your plant. And if any of these problems are the ones you're experiencing, you would click on that box and it will give you very concise um, information on the problem and um, on how to solve that problem. However, if you could not find a satisfactory answer on our Master Garden website, then you can try <clears throat> just doing a search on the internet with UCIPM and putting in the subject that you're interested in. This search <clears throat> will bring back information from the University of California. So these answers are reliable and science-based. Now remember, <clears throat> we always need to accurately identify the plant. And <clears throat> if you don't know what your plant is called, you can always take a sample to one of our local nurseries and they will probably help you identify it. But it's important to bring a significant sample don't bring a single itty bitty leaf. Make sure that you bring like a fair piece of stem and, you know, multiple leaves on it. And if it's a flowering plant, it's really helpful if you can bring 
a sample of the flower. Also, there are some pretty cool apps for your smartphone where within the app, you take a picture of your plant and it will come back and identify it for you. <clears throat> you should check some of these out. Um, some are free and others have a free trial period after which you will be charged an annual fee. Now these apps are not always 100% accurate the results depend a lot on the quality of your photo, but still they are a useful tool. Also, if you happen to use Google as your search engine on your smartphone, there is the Google Lens option. You don't need to download any apps. You just tap on the camera icon and take a picture of your plant and you will get uh, some names of plants along with pictures of them. Once again, it may not be 100% accurate all of the time. It depends on the quality of your picture, but you can always cross-reference the answers with other sources. So I hope you have learned about some new tools that will be useful to you in finding answers to your gardening questions. <clears throat> okay, now that we've got some answers to our gardening questions, let's get going. And I am going to take the advice that I found on our website, and I'm going to prune my bougainvillea so that I get more blooms. But before I get started, I am going to inspect my tools my pruners. It's really important to keep your tools clean and sharp. You want to keep them clean to make sure that you're not spreading disease from plant to plant. And also, you don't want your tools to get rusty and all gummed up because they, get, they become difficult to use. You want to keep your tools sharp so that you can make nice clean cuts to your plants so that you're not crushing the stem, thereby damaging it. Crushed stems are very susceptible to disease. And you also want to keep your tools sharp so that you're not um, unnecessarily using your hand muscles um, to a degree that makes them sore. Oh dear, look at those tools. I'm embarrassed to say that these were in my tool shed. Don't let your tools become this rusty. It's easy to keep them in good shape. Here are some tips. When you're gardening, try not to put your tools down on the soil. The grit can get into the working parts and always clean your tools before putting them away. Just rinse them off with a hose or wipe them with a damp rag. Then, and you could use a little soap if necessary. And always dry your tools before you put them away because trapped water creates rust. You can let your tools dry in the sun or use a dry rag and always coat your tools with a little bit of oil before putting them away. This also helps prevent rust. So I did manage to get these tools nice and clean. And you know what? It wasn't that hard and it didn't take all that long. Here are the tools that you will need, a rag, a wire brush, some steel wool. Don't use coarse steel wool though. Use really fine steel wool. Vinegar works really well for removing rust. Just soak your tools in the vinegar for a few minutes. And you need oil for coating the tools afterwards. There are many different kinds of oils that you can use. You can use motor oil, 
soaked into your rag. You can use spray cooking oil. I used WD-40, which is an all around household lubricating oil. Just do not use olive oil or vegetable oil because after a while it can make your tools kind of gummy. It all gets gummed up. Using oil is very important because oil displaces any water on the tool and that prevents rust. So this is what I did with those rusty tools that I found in my tool shed. I soaked them in vinegar just for about five or 10 minutes. I used the wire brush to loosen the rust. I wiped with a cloth and then I brushed a little more and all the rust came off fairly easily. Then I rinsed with a hose. I wiped them dry with a clean rag and then I sprayed on the oil and wiped the excess oil off. It's also a good idea to occasionally disinfect your blades, especially if you're dealing with any plants that are diseased. You can use bleach. To use bleach, you dilute it. You mix one part bleach to nine parts water. And please note, when you're dealing with bleach, more is not better. Um, the, the formula of one part bleach to nine parts water is the optimum formula for killing all the uh, plant pathogens. <clears throat> so just dip the blades into the bleach and then wipe them dry. The problem with bleach is that over time it can damage your metal and your plastic parts of the tools. There is also isopropyl alcohol. <clears throat> and you can use the alcohol. You don't need to mix it with anything or dilute it in any way. The tools can simply be wiped, sprayed with the alcohol or dipped in the alcohol for immediate effectiveness against most pathogens. Now this alcohol comes in a variety of strengths but anything 70% alcohol and above is fine for this purpose. <clears throat> Sharpening your tools. I don't know about you, but I've always been intimidated by the thought of sharpening my tools. Do you sharpen your own tools? Let's take a quick poll. Now remember, your answers will be anonymous. So Yvonne, can we have that poll, please? So please just answer. Um, do you sharpen your own tools? Okay, it looks like almost everyone's voted. Last couple votes coming in. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. Okay. Well, I'm impressed. 35% of you do sharpen your own tools. But wow, 65% of you don't. Whoa, suddenly I've lost the ability to advance my slides. There we go. Sharpening. Don't be intimidating. I know it can be very intimidating but I came across a video that does a pretty good job of covering the basics. <laughs> Whoa, sorry. I'm um, okay. Here we go. Hi, it's me. And I'm going to show you just how easy it is to sharpen your gardening tools. 
As an example, we're going to use these hand pruners. This is a bypass pruner. And I just wanted to explain that there's only one sharp surface, and that is on this bulging convex uh, blade. It has a bevel on it, and that's the only sharp surface. This section over here is not sharp at all. It's simply designed to hold the stem or the plant part as you make the cut. So to sharpen your tools, there are various devices that you can use. There are these diamond coated files and sharpening stones. And there is also a carbide, carbide sharpening tool. The file and the stones, they can sometimes have two different textures, a coarse side and a fine side. Same for the stones, a coarse side and a fine side. And they use a rubbing method. So you would start with the coarse side and you place the file on your, your uh, surface that you want to sharpen. And you don't place it flat or at a 45 degree angle. You try to match the angle of the bevel, which is normally around a 20 degree angle. So you just make small circular motions. You don't have to press very hard. So again, first with the coarse side, wipe off the grit, and now same with the finer side, small circular motions. And that's how you use a file or a stone. This other device is called a carbide sharpening tool. And this carbide steel is harder than the steel on your blade. And so instead of rubbing, you're actually going to scrape. And there's a very specific way to handle this tool. First, put the bevel side down. Put your hand underneath and hold it like this. Now this seems counterintuitive to have the blade facing you, but actually this is the safest way to handle it. And holding your hand like this, you have the most, you have the maximum leverage. So you take this tool and again, you position it matching the angle of the bevel and you make four or five passes along the blade from the pivot to the point. This creates a little bit of a burr on the opposite side. So you just take one pass to clean the burr. And voila, if I can do it, you can do it. One. So as we said, don't be intimidated. Keeping your tool sharp is really important. And as that lady said, it's really easy. Okay, wow. We've done a lot of hard work already. Researching, sharpening, pruning. I think it's time to go and have a picnic in our garden. And wouldn't you know it, just as I sit down to start eating my picnic, a pesky yellow jacket comes and lands right on my piece of cheese. You know, understanding a little bit about the yellow jacket, about their behavior and their life cycle will help you manage their population. When and where to place the traps and what you put in them makes a lot of difference. First, a little bit about their life cycle. In the fall time, most of the yellow jackets die off. That is all the thousands of drones and workers and the old queen, they all die. But the newly hatched and fertilized queens survive and they actually abandon the existing nest and crawl into some forest litter or some protected space often a burrow made by some rodents, and they hibernate underground 
over the winter. In the spring, the queens emerge to build their new nests. Each queen has to find a separate nest for her future colony. And until that first batch of drones is hatched, the queen has to go out on her own to find her own food. And this is the best time to make sure that your traps are out. This period of two to three weeks in early April, because every queen that is caught during this period eliminates several thousand yellow jackets later in the season. Once that first batch of drones is hatched, they take over the care and the feeding of the growing colony. And the queen concentrates only on laying more eggs and the colony grows exponen exponentially. Each nest can have tens of thousands of workers depending on the, the weather. A little bit about their behavior. <clears throat> Yellow jackets can travel a oh, thousand feet in order to find food. And once they have found food, they will keep returning to that source. So don't leave any food out um, unnecessarily. They fly in a straight line from their nest to the food source. So if you put several traps out on your property, you will notice that some get filled up a lot more than others. In the summertime, yellow jackets feed primarily on protein. They eat other insects such as flies, aphids, caterpillars, and bees. And oh yes, they like the protein in your meats and your cheeses on your picnic. Later in the season, from August to October, their food preferences change from proteins to sweets. And that's the time that you will see that they will be landing on your soda cans or on the cake in your picnic. Now you can make your own trap as shown in the diagram on the left. You take a two liter um, soda, plastic soda bottle and you cut the top third off. You place the bait in the bottom and invert the top section into the bottom section. The best protein to use in the spring is actually canned chicken, but it will have to be replaced every couple of days when it begins to rot because yellow jackets are not attracted to rotting meat. And in the fall, you should use a sweet soda as the bait in your own <clears throat> uh, homemade trap. You can also buy these store-bought traps that are shown on the right. And um, these cone cartridges are available and they last for 10 weeks. And the, the uh, attractant that is used in these traps is specifically designed for yellow jackets. So place these traps away from your eating area and preferably in a few different locations. And remember, if yellow jackets do show up to your picnic or your July 4th barbecue, don't swat at them. They're not interested in you. They're only interested in your food. <clears throat> a note of caution. If you locate a yellow jacket nest, it's best to call the Napa County Mosquito Abatement District. They will come and take care of the nest. Don't try to destroy it yourself. Yellow jackets become very aggressive if they feel that their nest is threatened. And they do not lose their barbs after they sting you. So they can sting several times and they can also bite. Now, yellow jackets are a pet subject of mine. For years, 
they had been quite a nuisance on our property. It was only when my son asked if he could have his wedding at our house that I researched this topic really thoroughly and was determined to conquer the problem. I did go a little overboard and I started setting out the traps in February sometime. I was determined not to let a single queen get past me. But it wasn't until the end of March or early April that I started to notice that I had a few customers in my traps. <clears throat> and I kept replacing the cones all summer, every 10 weeks. Well, the wedding was in September. We had a full sit down dinner and I did not see a yellow, a single yellow jacket. This strategy really works. So to recap, place your traps out early in the spring in order to catch the queens. Place the traps around the perimeter of your property and remember their diet preferences, meats and sweets, protein in the early spring and summer, carbs in the late summer. And don't try to destroy uh, the nests on your own. Contact the Mosquito Abatement District of Napa County. Well, I hope you not falling asleep on me yet because we have one more segment to cover tonight. <clears throat> We're going to de debunk a few gardening myths. You know, some gardening myths have been around for a long time and are well established. Their recommendations can sound very scientific and precise, but that does not mean that they are accurate. Check your source. If it's from a research um, organization, such as a university or a state agricultural agency, then it's reliable. So let's go to our first subject, coffee grounds in your garden and in your compost. There is so much conflicting information on the internet and a lot of it is general, uh, conflicting and very vague about adding coffee grounds to your soil and to your compost. It made my head spin while I was researching this subject. Some people add coffee grounds to acid loving plants like azaleas, hydrangeas and rhododendrons. It is true that higher acidity in the soil does turn hydrangea flowers to a pretty blue. But thinking that used coffee grounds are acidic is a total fallacy. Science tells us that the acid in your coffee is water soluble. So once the, the water passes over the coffee, it flushes the acid out. And the acid ends up in your coffee cup, not in the leftover grounds. <clears throat> Caffeine is also water soluble. Caffeine is bad for your plants because caffeine, if applied directly to your soil, can reduce plant growth. Plants that naturally produce caffeine, such as coffee plants and cocoa plants, evolve their caffeine content in order to kill off any plants in their surroundings. Coffee plants, coffee grounds also have antibacterial properties, which can be harmful to the beneficial organisms in your soil. They do contain some nitrogen, but not very much, only about 2% by volume. So that does not replace a nitrogen rich fertilizer. And if your soil is already high in nitrogen, that little bit of extra boost could stunt the growth of fruits and flowers. If you insist on using coffee grounds directly on your soil as a mulch, apply only a very thin layer, no more than half an inch, and cover with a thick layer 
about four inches of a coarse organic mulch, such as wood chips. <clears throat> Do not apply a thick layer of coffee grounds as a standalone mulch, because the grounds are very fine textures and can easily be compacted and interfere with the moisture and air movement in the soil. It is fine though to add coffee grounds to your compost pile, but never add hot coffee grounds. Allow them to cool down fully before adding them because the heat can kill the beneficial microbes in your compost. Also, compost that is spiked with coffee grounds, more than 30% can be detrimental. Coffee grounds do contain some nitrogen, so you need to consider them to be part of your green materials in your compost pile. Most compost formulas call for 30%, uh, excuse me, 50% of green materials and 50% of brown materials. Green materials are nitrogen rich, and these include grass clippings, leafy green yard waste, vegetable and fruit scraps from your kitchen, and used coffee grounds. Brown materials are carbon rich, and they include things like straw, paper, newspaper, cardboard, dried leaves, and coffee filters. So remember, don't add coffee grounds indiscriminately. The grounds should not add up to more than 20% of your green materials. On to the next subject, banana peels. In your garden for extra potassium, I've seen this on the internet and I was wondering how valid it was. Potassium is important for plant growth. It is one of the three ingredients in most fertilizers and those ingredients are nitrogen, phosphate and potassium. But some sources suggest that you should dry banana peels and then cut them up into little squares and sprinkle them around the base of your plant. Other sources suggest that you make a banana peel tea and then drizzle that tea along the base of your plant. You know, all organic matter is good for plants and soils, but not necessarily in those forms. It's not certainly not a good idea to bury an entire banana peel under your plant. It's best to add banana peels and other fruits and vegetables to your compost pile and let them decompose into a rich, diverse mixture of nutrients. Our next subject is amending soil in the potting hole. This advice sounds quite logical, and I'll admit I have done it. Some sources recommend adding 25 to 50% organic matter and other amendments. It seems to make sense that improving the soil would improve the growth and the survival of the plant. And that is true in the short term but radically changing the soil in the potting hole compared to the native soil, you are actually creating a pot in the ground. And when the roots grow and start to spread out and when they hit the harder native soil, they are going to circle back to the material in the potting hole and will only access the water and the nutrients in that planting hole. Also, that hole will act as a reservoir for rain and deprive the roots of the oxygen that they need. And finally, especially if you dig a deep hole, 
all that organic matter is going to decompose and your plant will sink below the level that you really want it to. So here's the correct way to plant a plant in the ground. So you dig a hole that's just as deep as the pot that the plant came in, not too deep. And then twice the width of the pot that the plant came in. And then you rough up the sides of the hole and the bottom of the hole. And you take the plant out of the pot. You can loosen some of the um, soil on the outside. And if there are a lot of roots that are growing around and around and are encircling, you know, the soil <clears throat> that the that the pot that the plant was in, you can snip some of those off. And you place the plant in the middle of the hole and you backfill using the original soil. And then to end the process, you spread a layer of mulch around the plant to keep the roots cool and to retain the moisture. One last uh, topic. Placing pebbles or gravel at the bottom of the container for better drainage. Who hasn't heard of this one? Who hasn't done it themselves? <clears throat> this is another piece of advice that seems, you know, on first thought to seem kind of logical. It's true that plants do need good drainage so that their roots can restrict receive the oxygen that they need. But it's also true that containers absolutely need a drainage hole. It's hard for the water to move from the fine, grade, fine grained soil, such as a potting mix, to a coarser material, such as gravel. The water has to fully saturate the fine grain soil before it moves down to the gravel. And here's a diagram to illustrate what I'm talking about. <clears throat> On the left, you see um, a well-watered container, and it will always have a saturated layer at the bottom of the, of the pot. And when you put a layer of gravel at the bottom, what you are doing is simply moving up that saturated zone. <clears throat> so by putting the gravel at the bottom, you're actually encouraging waterlogged soil, the problem that you're trying to prevent. The correct method is to fill the entire container with high quality potting mix and elevate the container off the ground so that the water can escape through the drainage hole. Or choose a deeper container and amend the potting soil with coarse material, such as perlite, crushed lava, or pumice. So we're gonna come for full circle and back to my bougainvillea. Here's how it looks now much healthier. I followed sound proven advice. I took it off the drip system and I water it by hand only when I notice that the leaves are beginning to wilt. And I'm pruning and deadheading it often. I'm no longer guessing about what the problem and what the solution is. As master gardeners, we don't have all the answers tucked away in our individual memories, but we are trained to ask all the right questions. And we are trained on where to find valid answers. And my goal tonight was to share those concepts with you. I hope you will stay for a few minutes more to take one more poll and for questions and answers. Um, when we take the poll, 
you will have to scroll down a little bit because it exceeds the, the height of your screen. So in advance, I want to thank you for watching. And I, I believe Yvonne is going to put up our poll now. Yvonne? Okay. Remember, um, as you answer these, scroll down to the very bottom. How are we doing on the poll, Yvonne? Pretty good. We just, uh, we don't have quite everybody, but we're pretty close. I'll leave it up for another second or two. Make okay. Last votes. Almost everybody. We've got 19 out of 25 so far. Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to close the poll. Everybody make your last minute votes here. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now. We've got 21 out of 25. Okay, that's pretty good. And I'm going to share the results with you. Oh, wow. Oh, fabulous. Everyone learned a new source for gardening information. Mm -hmm. Ooh, 95% are going to try sharpening their own tools. Which segment did you enjoy most? Oh, the winner is the myths. Oh, wow. Mm. Or all of the above. <laughs> yeah. Oh, darn, nobody put none, none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That means everybody oh. likes. <laughs> oh, somebody's very excited to start sharpening their own tools. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see who's out there. Okay. Okay, and I'm closing the polls up. We did have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, well, the first was actually just a comment. Um, we had a great comment from someone who knows a lot about pruning and um, the question or the comment was how do you know what tool to use for pruning and um, he sort of answered his own question his suggestion was that if you are trying to use a hand pruner and you're feeling a lot of pressure it's not an easy just to cut or snip the, the stem then you're probably using a tool that's too small um, you might want to move up to a lopper and if the lopper seems hard to cut also, it might just be that you have a very tough plant. You might want to move up to a saw, a hand saw, or a chainsaw, depending on the size of your cut. But that's a really good tool. Even if, you're, if your tools are sharp, it should be fairly easy to cut through the tissue that you're trying to cut through. And I don't know if you're looking at the chat. I see some comments. I don't see many questions. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, I guess it's like 757. I just want to thank everybody again for joining us. And um, I hope you learned something and I hope you had fun. We hope that you'll come to our next program next month. Um, we will be same day of the month. It'll be the first Thursday. It'll be from seven to eight again. And our topic next month is going to be moon gardens. So those are gardens that have a lot of night blooming and fragrant night fragrant flowers. So it should be a really great program. 
I know the library has lots of programs going on and they're reopening for programs. So we hope you'll go and enjoy some of the live programs down at the library in person and visit the library and get some great resources. Check our website if you want more uh, Master Gardener information or to sign up for the next workshop. Thank you everyone for coming. And thank you Olga for your presentation today. You're welcome.